Good afternoon. We'd like to welcome you to the Gabelli Funds live webinar series. Today we're excited to be bringing you a webinar titled Convertible Securities, Less Volatile Equity Investing. We're joined by three portfolio managers of the fund, Tim Dinsmore, Jane O'Keefe, and James Dinsmore. Together, they've been managing the convertibles composite since 1998 and have more than 60 years of combined experience. In 2015, Dinsmore Capital Management merged with Gabelli and began running the Teton Convertible Securities Fund in October of 2016. James Dinsmore has been a portfolio manager of the fund since 2010 and is an equity analyst since 2004. He is a CFA charter holder and has earned his MBA in finance and marketing from Rutgers University and has a BA in economics from Cornell University. I'd like to now turn the call over to James. Thanks, Chris. Um, appreciate that. Um, I'm joined here, as he said, by uh, my co-portfolio managers, Tom Dinsmore and Jane O'Keefe. Uh, they'll certainly be available for any questions uh, anyone has at the end of the call. Uh, Chris hit most of the high points on, on slide number two here, giving our backgrounds as to who we are. Uh, one thing I want to hit on uh, in addition to that is uh, sort of how we look at, at portfolio management um, and the convertible market and, and how we do things from a, a very much a fundam fundamental bottoms-up perspective um, where we're looking at, at individual equities and individual stocks and we're using convertibles um, to invest in them. And that's sort of been the, uh, the key backbone of our, of our portfolio management in convertibles um, is, is looking at every convertible issue that comes and um, the underlying equity and, and picking stocks that we like and investing in convertible, using convertibles as a means to invest in them. So uh, moving on to the next slide here, slide three, um, this is really one of the key takeaways of that strategy uh, as, far as, as far as I'm concerned. So what, what we've done over, over the life of our convertible composite is our net returns have been generally in line with the S&P 500 with three quarters of the volatility. Uh, and, and the same goes for the Russell. So by investing in convertibles, we've been able to get equity-like returns with lower volatility than equity indices and even um, the uh, BAML convertible index. Uh, so that's really the focus of how we manage the portfolio and what we're trying to achieve uh, going forward with Teton as well. So why should we allocate to Teton, uh, to the Teton Convertible Securities Fund? Well, there's a, there's a few reasons that I think are key um, to investing in Teton. Um, first is I think that volatility has returned to the markets. Um, convertibles are inherently less volatile uh, by being higher in the capital structure, uh, offering a yield advantage over their underlying common stock, uh, and they have a maturity or put. So what this allows is it, it helps to meaningfully reduce volatility in a portfolio. Uh, as I showed uh, in the last slide, that's been the history of, of our, our performance in the, in the product. Um, we think convertibles are an overlooked asset class. Uh, we think that they work very well in a volatile market and really for any market, you know, uh, 21 years of, of equity-like returns. Um, but really the key to that is what happens in volatile markets uh, is that we're protecting downside, uh, protecting the downside significantly. So uh, we'll show later on that in, in certain uh, negative markets, we've had significantly less downside than um, some of the major equity indices or even some of the other equity uh, alternatives that are out there. Uh, and you also, you're getting, one of the things that we like about converts is that you're getting sort of a diverse growth exposure um, with a combination of income and downside protection. So you're able to invest in some growth names that may, you know, look scary to you as an investment at certain valuations, but by picking up some yields and by by having a maturity, it, it significantly reduces the risk in um, some of these more interesting names that we're looking at in the, in the portfolio. The 2018, 2018 performance, I think, uh, speaks volumes as to what we anticipate in, in convertible performance. So uh, here we had a, a good market into August and then uh, obviously starting in September and then through the end of the year, uh, it, it became much more volatile. And uh, in 2018, you know, the numbers for the year are certainly great. We, we outperformed the S&P 500 uh, significantly. We were down 60 bips to the S&P 500, down uh, four and a half. 
Uh, we beat the Russell uh, fairly substantially as well, down 11 percent. So um, our performance through the end of the year, after we participated in most of the equity move higher through through August, uh, we we held up substantially when the market started to started to get more volatile. Uh, and this was in addition to being up, uh, we were up 18 percent in 2017. So we so we backed up a strong equity year. Um, with uh, with the type of performance that we would expect to see in a downside uh, in a volatile volatile market, uh, but you still are invested in the equity market. So, great December was a terrible month. Uh, we've come back into January, markets up eight percent, seven percent, and we were right there with it. Our our the Teton fund, Teton Convertible Securities fund, was up seven point six percent in the month of, of January. So that's one of the keys to convertible investing for us uh, is that convertibles bounce back quickly from um, from these types of dislocations that we saw in the market um, towards the end of December. Um, one other one other key and an important reason to allocate money to uh, Teton Convertible Securities Fund uh, recently um, there's been some some news that Vanguard is is shuttering their um, their convertible uh, offering, and they they basically said, okay, we can we can replicate our performance from a bond fund and an equity fund. Uh, well, that may be true for Vanguard's performance, uh, which was not particularly good, uh, but we think that they're really just talking their book in that cir circumstance. Uh, convertibles, if you were to invest in a bond fund and an equity fund, you're not going to get the same sort of bounce back um, in that we saw, say, in January. And uh, you're, you're not going to get the same sort of equity participation on the upside uh, that convertibles can provide, because what happens is you're essentially seeing more participation in equities as they move higher with converts um, and less participation on the downside. So you'd have to be constantly managing uh, how, you, how you're allocating between bonds and equities um, to sort of get that same sort of, same sort of return. Uh, and we think that we're very well positioned for a period of um, relatively lower returns and higher volatility. So you're getting both yield and capital appreciation in converts. So if the market is sort of flat to maybe up 5%, uh, that's a great market for us. We think we can outperform in that market um, just based on, on the structure of convertibles. When we're down, obviously, I showed our performance in 2018. So when we're down, we think we can outperform on the downside, and, and we have often showed that, that that's the case. Um, but you're still invested in equities, and you still get to participate in strong up markets. So I, I quickly referenced 2017 earlier, but we were participated in and, and saw the performance, generally most of the performance of um, of equities in, in 2017, which obviously was a great year in equity markets. So getting to sort of an overview of convertible market performance uh, in some of the volatile periods that we've seen. So this is just some data on the Morningstar convertible universe relative to equity markets, some of the broader equity indices. Uh, and you can see that um, you know, it was less than 50% of the downside of the S&P last year. Uh, it was less than a quarter of the downside of the S&P uh, during the internet bubble, uh, which was a really strong strong period, uh, relatively speaking, for converts. And then again, in, even in 2008, where you have this black swan uh, negative equity event, uh, the convertible universe was still down um, only three quarters or less than three quarters of the downside uh, in that environment. So they've held up historically very well in, in, negative, in negative markets. So moving on to slide six, uh, we can look at our uh, composite performance over, some, over many market cycles, uh, sort of the same time frames, and you kind of get a feel for, for what our performance has done. And this really hits, it hits a lot of the same points. You see that we're down a quarter in, in the, the Internet bubble crash in, in 2000 through 2003. We're down about a quarter of the S&P. Uh, same goes for the financial crisis. Um, but again, that was you know sort of a, a different structure of market than we see today. Uh, and we think that 2018 was much more indicative of um, the current market, where we saw substantially less downside um, participation in equity indices moving lower uh, in 2018 than we did 
um, certainly in, in 2008. One of the main reasons for that differentiation, in 2008, uh, the convertible market was uh, pre prevailingly run by hedge funds and uh, convertible arbitrage funds. Uh, so you had a scenario where when um, Lehman Brothers goes down and, and prime brokerage blows up, uh, the funds were having redemptions and, and a, a whole number of, of issues that were causing uh, convertibles to trade much lower than they should have in, in that time frame. Um, and so that's certainly not the case today. So at the time it was, you know, 80 to 90 percent hedge funds. Today it's more balanced, 50-50, uh, uh, sort of 40-60 hedge funds uh, to outright. So uh, we think it's a much healthier market today, uh, and, and we anticipate that, you know, sort of the downside protection we saw after the Internet bubble, but also in 2018 is, is sort of more what we would expect um, in this market uh, if we were to see a correction from here. Moving on to page seven, um, we think that active management is a very important part of convertible selection and, and convertible investing. Uh, Barclays runs a uh, CWB, a convertible ETF, and uh, we find it to be inherently riskier than the market. So. Um, generally, it's dominated by a few large issues. Uh, in, in, in 2016, for example, NVIDIA was half of the, the upside performance. So the, the ETF was up about 10% in 2016, and NVIDIA was worth 5% of that. Uh, same thing in 2017, Alibaba was over a quarter of the annual performance. Uh, so you're getting what's happening is that in NVIDIA in 2016, you had this great equity move, and the converts participated in that, but then it became just this massively large percentage of, of the funds. So you're, you end up with, a, with a, an ETF that is just more equity sensitive than what you should have in a convertible portfolio. We should be looking for sort of balanced total return, income, and capital appreciation. Well, uh, the returns in... 2016 and 2017 for these for, for the ETFs were largely just capital appreciation, which is great, unless that goes the other way because now you're just not getting the downside protection, and and we saw that to some extent in the in the ETF in 2018, Alibaba uh, sort of underperformed in 2018 and that held back uh, some of the performance of of 2018 and it was strictly because Baba was 10% of the of the ETF uh, you know today it's eight and a half percent of the ETF and it's it goes away in June so it's uh, it's an interesting dynamic um, that is sort of something that we don't necessarily see in the broader equity ETFs um, so you know they're gonna have to the massively rebalance uh, in in June when when eight percent of the ETF goes away uh, so and 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 really it just as I mentioned, it, it were more equity, or the, the ETFs are more equity sensitive at the tops and less equity sensitive at, at lows. Uh, so we think that it just doesn't give you the sort of structure that you would be hoping for in owning a convertible ETF. Uh, so we really think active management is key. So slide eight is, uh, moving on to slide eight, is just sort of another way to look at some of the downside protection. And, and really the key takeaway here to me is uh, the months to recover. So uh, if you look at, at the second line on, on each of these lines, um, the number of months to recover. So Gabelli convertibles in the Internet bubble crash, we were down, as, as discussed before, a quarter of, or, you know, uh, substantially lower than the equity markets. Uh, and we were back to where we were in 2000, eight months later. Uh, so some of the other equity surrogates had similar time frames at that. Uh, but it was it was a very quick rebound for us, as opposed to the equity markets, which took, as we know, years to recover. Uh, and then the same was true of 2008. Uh, we were back to market highs uh, or pre pre crisis highs uh, in 20 months, uh, which was the fastest to recover, and again significantly faster than equity markets. And um, our performance since the crash uh, has certainly outperformed uh, some of the other equity surrogates that. Uh, also provided quick bounce back. So uh, we think it's a, a, an interesting sweet spot in terms of um, getting, gaining exposure to equities with uh, reduced volatility. Getting to the market uh, as a whole on slide nine, 
the convertible market is slightly differently broken down than the broader equities market. So it's, uh, you know, as you can see here, 30% 30, 30 information technology, 16% healthcare. So it's a little bit more growth focused um, than, uh, than perhaps the S&P 500 is. Um, but we find it to be a very diverse mix of issuers. Uh, we have, you know, just under 500 issues uh, that are outstanding, uh, a little over 200 billion in in market cap. Um, roughly, the the market breaks down. the The median market cap of of the universe is roughly two and a half to three uh, three billion in market cap. So that kind of gets at you know why we show the Russell as well as as the S&P 500. So it, it's inherently a little smaller market cap than the S&P 500, um, but we think that this is the key is is by investing in in convertibles uh, you get to move up the capital structure in some of these smaller companies you get to participate in equity upside as that three billion dollar company becomes a 20 billion dollar company uh, all while picking up yield that a lot of the common stocks don't offer um, you know so that the convertible market as a whole has a 2.6 percent yield um, the underlying stocks of the convertible market have a 1.1% yield. Um, so, so just in general, the convertible market has roughly a 1.5% yield advantage over their underlying common stocks. Um, so it's, it's, we, we find it to be a very attractive market. We, we quite um, enjoy looking at and, and learning about every issue that's out there, um, but it is a, a, a nice, diverse place to, uh, to, to pick from it for investments. Uh, and we find the market to be more liquid um, than than it might imply uh, at 200 billion outstanding. Uh, so Barclays did a study showing uh, that the turnover in the convertible universe, uh, on a percentage of of the size of the based on a percentage of the size of the universe, is actually more significant than uh, than that in in high yield. So uh, generally, very liquid market. And um, and that the reason for that kind of gets at the balance that I was talking about earlier, where we have a balance of, of hedge funds and outright funds that are investing in it. So there's there's different reasons that people are buying and selling convertibles. So that's really helpful in terms of liquidity. So getting to slide 10 and how we look at the universe. So there's sort of three buckets that we're looking at. Um, there's the equity surrogate bucket, the total return bucket, and the fixed income equivalent bucket. Our ideal asymmetrical risk reward profile happens in the total return bucket, but we we invest in all three places. So we're we're looking at every convertible that's issued. Um, sort of we sort of maintain a knowledge base of all of the issues that are outstanding, and we're we're investing in new issues as we see them as as we see them to be appropriate for the portfolio. But we're also coming back to them and revisiting them. Um, for example, if we start to see market volatility and suddenly uh, the terms become more attractive um, because the, the issue is down uh, since, uh, since issue or um, maybe the issue is a little bit higher, but the premium has come in and now it makes more sense to us as a way to, as a way to invest. So when we're looking at equity surrogates, we don't necessarily start looking at equity surrogates, uh, but this gets at the, the fundamental bottoms up process that we do. So when we're looking at uh, an underlying equity, if we feel strongly about the, an underlying equity, we will continue to own a convertible as it becomes more equity sensitive. So you know the examples I gave of, of CWB owning Nvidia and Baba, those are names that we would we have also owned in our portfolio because we felt strongly about the underlying fundamentals. What we were doing differently than CWB at those times is that we were sort of keeping the position in check. So we would, we're sort of peeling on the way up um, because we don't want to get too far away from that asymmetrical return. So the total return, as I said, is sort of the sweet spot. You're getting a mix of income and capital appreciation, generally around par uh, for the converts. Um, and this is why we really like to look through the new issue market as they happen. Uh, we think that they, can be a very, very uh, fruitful offerings um, for us there because you're, you're getting more equity upside than downside in that, that sort of bucket. And then the fixed income equivalent, essentially what's happening is that if, if 
the equity has underperformed significantly since the convertible was issued, you're falling back on the bond attributes of a convert and it'll trade roughly to where straight debt would trade in terms of yield to maturity or yield to put. So uh, for some names that, for some equities that we have, have owned and feel very comfortable with the balance sheet, being in the fixed income equivalent space is, is okay because we're picking up substantial yield and we're, and we're comfortable with the balance sheet there. So, so there's sort of three buckets that we're looking at in the, in the convertible universe. Um, and I think they're all key to, to how we structure our portfolio in a given market. As I said earlier, one of the, one of the things that you get from the convertible universe is, is diverse growth exposure with downside protection. So you're moving up the capital structure, picking up a yield advantage over the common stock, and, and you're increasingly seeing more and more capital appreciation as the underlying stock moves higher. So if, if when it's issued, a convertible is trading at a 55 or 60 delta, as that bond moves higher, you're going to see your delta move higher as well. So um, that's kind of the key to the performance on the other side, on the upside, is that you're getting more and more upside uh, as, as, as you go on. And down at the bottom here, we have some of the basic stats on our portfolio. Uh, this was as of the end of the year. Um, so this is, you know, 105 price, uh, that's relative to par. So we're, we were priced slightly higher than par, uh, 55 delta. So just based on, on the face of it, we would expect to see about a little more than half of the equity moves to the upside. As I said, we participated in much more than that in January. So, so we've seen this delta move higher um, through the month just as we've, we've gotten more equity sensitive. Uh, and so here, our, our current median market cap is $4.1 billion. Uh, 2.3 duration. So it's interest rate sensitivity is not something, and I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, but uh, interest rate sensitivity is is not key to the to the equation as much as equity sensitivity is in in how we look at convertibles. So here's the interest rate slide, and um, there's a couple of ways that we like to look at this. So this there's a lot going on here, um, but I'll quickly go over what the slide shows at first, which is that since we've been measuring our management of convertibles going back to 1998, there have been nine periods where the 10-year U.S. Treasury has been up by more than 100 basis points, where the yields, uh, yields have risen by more than 100 basis points. Uh, in all 10 of those, or in all nine of those periods, uh, our performance has been positive, significantly outperforming, obviously, um, the greater bond markets. So this is not an interest rate sensitive vehicle. It is much more related to the underlying equities in terms of what the sensitivity you're getting. Now, we may be exiting the rising rate environment. The last last rising rate period ended in, in October and, and it's possible that from here we may either be flat or perhaps down in terms of rates. Um, so we looked at some of the periods in addition to this. We looked at the 12 months following each of these periods and, and again, convertibles were higher seven of eight times in those periods. And we even looked at uh, circumstances where you see an inverted yield curve uh, based on twos and tens. And in, uh, there's only been five of those that have happened in this, in this time. Uh, but in four of those five times, 12 months after the yield curve inverted, convertibles were still higher. So um, sort of in all interest rate environments, uh, convertibles have tended to uh, to generally outperform and do 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 fairly well. Moving on to slide 12, uh, quickly reviewing uh, the the market in 2018, uh, we saw the best year for new issuance uh, with over over 52 billion in new issues, 133 issues. This is the highest since 2008. Uh, it, it was a great year for issuance. We were able to participate in, in a lot of names that we uh, we saw early on uh, that did well, and then we were able to return to some issues that, that didn't do so well after the market volatility. Uh, again, we outperformed in the year, much like we thought that we should. Um, you know, we've talked often about the fact that in volatile, flat to down markets, we're going to outperform, and that was the case this year. It was not a 
black swan type of type of event. We, th we think that that's a, a strong showing in in the in the market. Um, and then we anticipate looking forward, we anticipate that issuance is going to continue. Uh, we think there are a number of reasons why uh, companies might issue convertibles in uh, in 2019. Uh, not least of which is that with, with rates higher than they've been, they generally are uh, a better place to play than, uh, or better, more attractive for companies to issue uh, than high yield. So we anticipate to see some continued shift from high yield into uh, convertibles uh, in terms of company issuance. Uh, so we're, we're anticipating that the market should continue to grow from here. And then finally, I'll finish up here. Um, we believe that the case for strategic convertible allocations remains uh, very strong. Uh, we think we've made the case for, for volatile, mar volatile markets, but I think all markets are, are a good place to have some percentage of your holdings in, port in convertibles. Uh, as we've said, over 21 years, uh, our performance has been generally in line with the equity markets and three quarters of volatility. Um, you, get to exp you get to maintain equity exposure uh, if you're unsure where the market goes from here, you'll still participate in upside from here um, while while taking some of the downside risk off the table. Um, and that's, you know, active management is key, we think, to maintaining that sort of asymmetrical profile from here. Uh, we can make sure that we're not too equity sensitive and not being dominated by a handful of names. We can be much more diverse and, and, and the names that we like um, and, and maintain a, a proper risk reward exposure. Um, and so, you know, our end game is to achieve total returns um, through a mix of capital and capital appreciation and income. Uh, so you're going to be able to participate more in equity upside than you are in the downside. So those are really the kind of the, the three key points of, of why we think um, convertibles are uh, an important place to be from here. So, uh, and finally, you know, and if you have any questions, we're, we're always out on the road talking to people. I'm always happy to have uh, calls with people and, and the wholesalers uh, have done a very good, jan uh, very good chance, uh, a very good job of uh, meeting, with, meeting with people out there. So uh, if you have any questions, uh, please type them in the uh, Q&A box and we will be sure to answer them. Um, just a first question. Uh, what kind of markets would be the toughest for convertible investing? So the toughest market that we've seen for convertible investing, what happens is that in, um, so I'll, I'll use the example of 2015 uh, was a tough market for convertibles. So leading, into, leading up to 2015, you saw 2013 and 2014 were significant equity moves higher. And um, but there was not much convertible issuance in those markets. So what happened was we were ending up kind of more in the equity surrogate bucket, uh, not because we wanted to be there, but because uh, that was where a lot of the names were. There, we weren't sort of refreshing the convertible market with new issues around par. Um, so then in when 2015 came and it was sort of a more volatile environment, we were more equity sensitive heading into that uh, than we thought um, we thought we should be, um, and so that made for a very difficult market in 2015. We still we still did generally well in that market, um, but uh, a lack of issuance in uh, after after seeing equities move significantly higher uh, is a, is a tough market for for convertibles. I think this market is very different. Even though we've seen equities move higher, uh, we saw significant issuance in 2018. So there's a lot of opportunity for us out there. So this is a very different market than that. So, um, but that's been traditionally what the hardest market has been for us in the past. Great. Uh, we have a question here, in the, uh, here from Barbara. Uh, what happens if supply starts to dry up? Do you guys uh, utilize cash reserves? So if supply starts to dry up, um, we certainly we certainly could, uh, you know, in in that example that I just gave, I, we certainly could uh, be more in cash if we decided that, uh, you know, we didn't want to be equity sensitive in that market, and we were we were hoping to see something, uh, some new issuance pick up. Um, we we 
are certainly aware of how the new issuance new issue market is always acting, and there are times when when we will kind of keep a little bit more cash than we might otherwise um, in anticipation of certain issues. Uh, and that would certainly be the case if, if we thought that we were getting too equity sensitive and, and didn't didn't see um, the types of total return convertibles out there that we wanted to wanted to see. Uh, cash is certainly an option. Uh, we haven't really had an environment where we've needed to do that, um, but it, it would be something that we could do if uh, if necessary. Great. Um, how does the fund break down as far as equity sensitivity, total return, and, and fixed income equivalents? Sure. So the uh, right now um, the fund is about 22% equity sensitive, 58% total return and 19% fixed income. So very much sort of in the middle straddling the, the, the balanced uh, total return type of portfolio. As I discussed, I, we think that that's uh, a great place to be set up for sort of asymmetrical returns. So the equity sensitive stuff are, are names that we have high conviction in and feel very comfortable owning. Um, not that we don't have high conviction in our total return names, but we recognize that uh, they have they are showing the biggest downside potential if we were to see a market move lower or an equity move lower um, so uh, you know it's important that we have conviction in the names that we are, are have more equity exposure in um, whereas the other names in terms of total return um, you, you know it's more balanced sort of between income and capital appreciation there so we, we know that uh, even if the structure can be more helpful, in the total return and fixed income buckets than it is in the equity sensitive bucket. In the equity sensitive bucket, it's really we're investing in equities there, um, just using convertibles as a as sort of middleman. Great. And just one more uh, last question here, just quickly. Uh, what's the median market cap of the fund? I know you had touched on uh, on this a little bit prior. Uh, yeah. Uh, the median market cap as it stands currently, I think is four. I think I said it was 4.1%. Uh, we've generally been in the three to four billion range, uh, as has the market as a whole, um, in terms of median market cap. There are certainly large issuers that are issuing converts. Uh, like I said, there's a convert in Alibaba. Um, you know, Intel has a convert. Uh, you know, some of the larger larger companies that are out there. Um, Tesla has a bunch of converts that are outstanding. Uh, microchip, Micron, a few others. So. Um, there are certainly larger companies that we can invest in and converts, but um, sort of the sweet spot we've found is is at that lower, you know, sort of mid, small to mid cap side where you're you're getting attractive terms on a convertible. You've got a lot of upside for the companies potentially as they, uh, you know, kind of build their businesses and and move higher. And, and we've found that traditionally it's been a great place to to be in the convert space. And then we have a, another question here. What percentage of the portfolio is considered high yield? Um, well, in terms of fixed income, we don't have anything that I would consider high yield as, uh, you know, in terms of specifically straight high yield debt. Um, but in terms of uh, how the um, how our portfolio breaks down, we do have um, some exposure to companies that, uh, would be, you know, sort of uh, single B or 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 so rated. Uh, much of the much of the convertible universe is not rated, um, but our our portfolio in terms of sort of the fixed income sort of broken more more bond like names. Um, as I said, we're we're about 19% in that that side of things. Um, so it's it. It's difficult to uh, to necessarily put a number on it since it's it's like I said most converts are not rated and um, you know in terms of what we're looking at we kind of we tend to stay away from the fixed income side unless we feel very comfortable with um, the underlying equity uh, obviously in the balance sheet but it's, it it has to be a name that we've known for a while and and feel comfortable with um, to to be invested in something that is is more fixed income oriented. Great. Thanks, James. Uh, we'd like to thank you, James, as well as uh, Tom.
Tom and Jane for uh, joining the call today, and we'd like to thank everybody uh, who has been on the call. Um, if you have any further questions or anything additional that we can provide for you, please follow up with your uh, respective investment representative, or you can call 1-800-422-2222. Seven four, or you can email us at advisor at gabelli .com. Once again, I'd like to thank everyone for joining the call, and we hope you have a great afternoon. Thank you.